Welcome to today's uh, seminar by Lawrence Suryana. Uh, she needs no introduction to the, all the participants present here. Uh, she is the CEO of European Climate Foundation. Uh, she is also is a chairperson and of the board of governors of uh, French Development Agency AFD. Uh, someone who has been a very active voice in climate change space for a uh, lo very long time. Uh, she was France's climate change ambassador for, Co for COP21 and a key architect of the uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, I requested her to join today's uh, seminar and talk to us about her perspectives on the uh, global negotiations on climate. A lot of things are developing uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, today and tomorrow, the US president is hosting uh, global leaders on climate. And we are all waiting to see what emerges from those discussions. Um, later this year, we have the COP. And uh, within India, there is a, a very intense debate going around on uh, what could be India's options, long-term options. Uh, should we commit to a long-term net zero target? Should we not? There's a, a very vociferous debate going in the media. So uh, we thought we'll, we'll listen to Lawrence and have her perspectives uh, on some of these issues. And Lawrence, I'm really grateful for you to have accepted this invite. I will uh, hand over to you and uh, walk us through your thoughts. Um, given that we have time till about 3.30, uh, I suggest we uh, you could talk for, say, 30, 35 minutes, and we keep 20 minutes for question for uh, audience questions. So with that, over to you, and I'll request people to kindly mute uh, those who are not speaking so that there is no background noise. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anshu, and very, uh, very honored to have been invited to speak at your seminar. Um, it just um, really, uh, you know, it's good, good to have a, a moment together with you to think and uh, take a step back from all these uh, events that are taking um, place every day. Um, I, I will talk about the global climate regime and how it's shaping up uh, post the US election. Uh, and of course, of the context of the global transition to need zero and the key enablers in my view that can bring us there. And so in particular on the short-term ambition, because of course, uh, and that's a conversation we had many years ago, I'm sure we cannot get to uh, a decarbonized society uh, if we don't start now. So let me start with the changing geopolitics and emerging climate collaboration. Of course, today and tomorrow, as you said very rightly, Anshu, there is a, a, a very important discussion taking place. Uh, and it is a, way, a relief for the global climate regime to have a US president believing it, it's important to act on climate change. And, and really, we have many proof of this. It's not only about diplomacy, it's about the domestic policy. So US is back rejoining the Paris Agreement, which is very important. Uh, and in, it's still, of course, a greater confidence in the viability of the climate regime. And when US inviting all these key economies around the table to show what the US willing to do on climate and how there can be really a bit of a rebuilding of global cooperation to fast track climate action. This creates many opportunities to see where collaboration between countries can take place. Um, and But as well, I think we can change the way we think about the climate regime. Since December 2016, you, as you know, we have been on the back foot when it comes to the climate regime. A US administration that was very belligerent to the climate agenda, as well as undoing many good things that were put in place, not just within the US, but also globally. So we have to find a strategy of containment in a way. We had to work out a defensive strategy and we had to find a counterbalance with the US influence. So it was important to ensure that we work with a positive force in the US like we are still in movement coalition to contain the damage that the administration was doing to climate regulation within US. While internally we did manage to bring many actors like states, investors, cities, business together in the United States, externally, we had to think of an entirely different approach. We had to build new partnership and reinforce some relationship. The EU was central to this and stepped up substantially to work alongside 
the Chinese and the Canadian to establish a ministerial on climate action, the MOCA, which was meant to be parallel to the major economies forum established before by the Americans. We have worked very closely with EU member states like France, Germany, UK to ensure that they fill the gap uh, in climate diplomacy that was left uh, with the US retreat. While I think from a pure emission reduction perspective, we lost precious time to bring emissions down in the last uh, past four years. But at least we did manage to ensure that the confidence of countries in the Paris Agreement was not threatened, and that all major economies besides the US continue to support action under the Paris Agreement as well increase their ambition. And I must say, I thank India and in general as a country, as government, as many actors that have really been very faithful to that direction and believing in the multilateralism. So now it's a new beginning with all partners. Uh, so the climate regime seen the change in the US administration has seen renewed energy. Uh, I, as, as many of you, I work very closely with many in the Obama administration to successfully deliver on Paris Agreement. And it's good to see that many, most of them, all of them almost, of those individuals are part of the Biden administration. One would think that they can just pick up from where we left in 2016, but unfortunately we can't because there have been many substantial shifts in the geopolitical paradigm. One of the biggest shifts in the relationship between China and US, the type of relationship shared by these countries were not as adversarial as it is in the current time. Climate change continues to be a topic of collaboration between the two countries as we saw with the declaration of John Kerry and um, Special Envoy Chesenwa, but there were many key areas of disagreement uh, around human rights, trade policy, security, especially in the South China Sea. Still unfolding, but it's definitely something to look at closely in order to see how the two biggest emitters will work together on climate change while competing on many other spaces. The other big shift within the geopolitical space is changing dynamic within Asia. While India and China continue to have a strained relationship, there are new relationships being built within the Asia Pacific region. As a feedback effect from the US China relationship and China bilateral relationship with Australia, India, and Japan, some of the major economies and emitters within Asia are coming together, not necessarily on climate change, but around security concern, which are also shaping collaboration between these countries. And we have, in a way, to take this in account. So new relationships also are playing a role in redefining how countries collaborate with each other and put stress on all the cooperation mechanisms, like the basic group, which was formed primarily to influence the global negotiation. I think this shift we are seeing is also reflecting the changing nature of the climate regime. And maybe that's a more important element. I know COP26 is a very important milestone in the global climate negotiation, of course. Still many pending decisions, carbon market, adaptation, transparency, climate finance. But while this makes the global negotiation important, there is another trend I think it's worth noting. So climate regime of the past was very much centered around the global negotiation. We kept moving from COP to COP to agree on a global framework that is effective and will work for all countries. Took three decades, by the way, or so, of this negotiation Paris Agreement to be agreed and come into force. And the Paris Agreement is not perfect by far, but it's built in a way that can improve upon without necessarily disturbing the underlying framework of the agreement. And that has changed the climate regime, we are moving away from a purely a negotiated oriented regime into a more, much complex regime where trade, where there is economic interplay with many, many other topics, in particular, industrial competition, innovation, trade, you know, many, many, uh, and many, many actors. This is always redefining relationship among countries where new partnerships are formed in order to maximize competitive advantage. And the relationship between the businesses, the local level and the, and the government in the climate policy is finally much more important than what can happen now on the global scene, which is a place where every, every, everybody will meet, but now the, the, the process is clearly uh, on the nation-based uh, element. This brings me to a second question of the talk, the net zero economy. 
we have seen in the past few years, I was talking with the Secretary General of OECD yesterday in a panel, and we were reminded ourselves that 150 or something countries have committed to a net zero commitment by 2050 or around this date. So business, even all companies, cities, region, investors, countries, everyone is announcing a commitment to net zero, of course, with different time frame. I can say that the Paris Agreement call for this commitment as it is one of the objectives of the agreement to reach net zero in the second half of the century. There are of course many doubts around this commitment to net zero and, and I have them as, as well. Whether they trigger the necessary short-term action, are they just a means to greenwash? Do they lead to false solutions that might do more harm than environment than good? And you know, some element, for example, or on sequestration or carbon markets can be of course an issue. Uh, if there is not a sound emission, innovation, trans economic transformation. But we should take a step back. I've seen so many pieces in the recent two months or so, particularly on India, likely commitment to net zero at one point in time. They range from suggesting a cautious approach to net zero and going as far as to see that India should, under no circumstances, commit to net zero. Of course, that's a question for Indian government and stakeholders that has to deliberate, discuss, and decide. But let me add my two cents uh, on this broader debate on net zero. You know, now all G7 economies have committed to net zero. Um, and if you pick the G20 countries, 15 of them of the G20 countries have a net zero commitment. And some will likely announce it today during the summit, which apparently it will be the case. This is not really about peer pressure. It's just announcing a target just because of other countries are doing it. To me, it is all different. It's preparing for the future. I think over the past few years, there's a greater understanding amongst countries and economic actors that climate change is unfortunately an, an inevitability. And we can approach this inevitability from a position of strength if we start preparing our economies for this, especially if we start to think of developing our economies in a way so that we have a competitive advantage, a resilient economy in the future. And of course, trying as much as we can to decrease the potential damage of climate change. If the world is moving toward net zero emission, we will need to imagine a new economy which will have different material requirements, as well as different needs in the context of minimizing emission. And you can see this being reflected in the way where some countries are contextualizing their net zero commitment as a new green deal, whether it is in US or in Europe, in the past, a new deal pretty much ushered the world into a different economic model of production and consumption. So I think we can expect, if I remember the 30s, something similar in the coming decade. So a, a wave of innovation, a wave of transformation of the economic system, of the way we consume or produce um, to, together with this in that direction. You know, there are also trends that point in that direction, whether it is people like Elon Musk, a person most popular for his electric car company, becoming the richest man of countries like Australia, who are major producer of fossil fuels, starting to think seriously about diversification into hydrogen, which is likely to be, and I know India is interested in it, a major fuel of the future. There are many more, and there are important trends to take into cognizance. Countries should really start thinking now how they will create the space for themselves in a future global <laughs> economy and how they will plan their broader strategic goals of economic development in, with, within that framework. So what are the competitive advantages they could leverage, whether it's producing the greenest steel, which I know it's a discussion in India, to producing specific components for electric mobility, to even services like design buildings, so zero, uh, emission buildings uh, potential in a way that minimize its emission footprint. Just like we see countries with specific advantages in the current economic structure, we will likely see countries establishing such advantage in the global net zero economy as well. And that's the moment to think about that. I think this presents a tremendous opportunity for countries like India who had a huge untapped potential and above all, 
a very, very high technical capacity to establish that advantage in the future. You, your brain capacity in India can, of course, deliver many, many solutions to these new challenges. Look at the case of COVID vaccine. India is a big player in that space. It has a global advantage in production of vaccine, but manages as, as well to have an indigenous one. This capacity help India with the diplomacy with other countries and ensure India is at the center of any global response to COVID. That's exactly what should be the case for the net zero economy. So let's now move to the near term. To conclude, we are now nowhere near the level of ambition we need from countries on their near-term targets. NDCs that most countries have put forward are not sufficient to keep us within a good chance of stabilizing global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. While again in the past few years, we have focused very much on key mitigation technologies, particularly renewable energy and increasing the share in the overall energy mix. While continuing that push, we need to start now looking more closely at some key enablers, particularly the financial sector. Very clear from analysis done by think tanks that recovery package where greenest in countries where financial actors of the country were sensitized to the importance of climate change. It would be, of course, important that through the UNFCCC negotiation, more climate finance flows to the developing countries. And we know, of course, the condition that India is facing to, to have access to the capital markets. And we know that the scale of need, just finance from GCS would never be enough. So we need to find ways in which we mobilize the financial actors like banks, investors, domestic saving, international as well, to support the transition to a net zero economy. And of course, the investment plan of India is very clear on that process, in particular on the renewable energy development. These enablers will not help create a conducive environment for an eventual transition to net zero, but will allow countries um, increase their immediate climate action and ambition as well, not only create the conducive environment, but create the immediate capacity for government to be confident that they can deliver that. There are very positive noise coming from the IMF, multilateral development banks, as well as coalition of finance ministers who are looking at way in which we can support countries in their transition. It's not unfortunately at scale where we need to be. Banking sectors across many countries still not sensitized to the needs of climate action. We will need to think of creative financial tools that allow finance to flow into the right places where it is most needed and where we get the biggest bang for the buck. Just as an example, if you look at the area of adaptation, while we are very aware that adaptation needs are large, across countries and communities. And they are already facing impact from climate change now. We are still not able to inject finance into the space enough at the scale and the pace required. Global effort around creating insurance mechanism for this are a step in the right direction, but we need to scale up such effort. And there are so many solutions, nature-based solutions for adaptation as well, that can at the same time limit the damage of climate change and protect from the, from the impacts. So overall, I think we have our tax cut out with sensitizing financial actors, proposing creative ideas that allow for finance to flow in the right space through design of unique financial tools. I will stop there, but rather than me just speaking for the whole hour, of course, I would of course, be very happy to exchange ideas with you. And again, um, I highlight in, particularly how using Shakti Foundation can work around all this. I would be really interested in how your views and how we can think how organizations like mine can collaborate with you. And again, very sorry because of my your health concern, I, I would have to leave you at in a little bit more than one half hour shot. And again, thank you very much for Shakti Foundation to have invited me. I was so sorry not to be able to visit India this year and last year, and hopefully it will be, this will be ended at the end of this year, hopefully. And I'm really anxious and eager to meet again with all uh, my dear Indian colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurence. Thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful uh, views and giving, a, give, giving us a flavor of the various issues on the table 
I think that's a pretty comprehensive list look from technology, finance, adaptation, and uh, all the issues involved in international negotiations. Um, as you said, uh, in India, there has been a, a vigorous debate in the media over last uh, month and a half. Uh, and we try to track what the various scholars are saying. So there is one view uh, that, well, we should, uh, we, we should not compromise on development and we still uh, need some carbon for our development before we can think of decarbonizing. Uh, that's one view which has emerged. There's another view that, uh, you know, regardless of uh, the time frame or regardless of whether India commits or not, uh, at some point of time in the future, our emissions will have to come to zero. Uh, and that's a global requirement. Uh, whether that is 2050, 60, or whatever time frame, we are looking at three or four or maybe five decades from now. So if that be the case, why not we plan for this transition? Uh, and then there are scholars who are uh, highlighting that, well, we should contribute to the global uh, uh, challenge. At the same time, be mindful of the uh, scale of transition India has to undertake uh, uh, to shift to an all clean economy. My personal take, uh, and I published a couple of articles, has been to say that uh, India has the opportunity to show, uh, to, to show a new developmental paradigm where we illustrate that economic development is, can be decoupled from fossil fuels. That's been my personal take on this. Uh, and the fact that in the last 10 years, energy efficiency and renewables have taken deep roots in the economy. And it's, we have a great chance to build upon that. So that's been my view on this. I also believe 30, 40 years is a good enough time frame to plan a transition to uh, in, a, in a manner which is good for our economy by creating jobs, livelihoods, etc. So I'll pause here. Uh, I have a few questions, but I'll pause and I'll request uh, colleagues from uh, participants to please have their say, and then I'll come back. Yes, sir. This is in this side. So you course, I wanted to thank uh, Saraj for the uh, you know, very balanced talk that she has given us. The main point I want to make is that a net zero target by itself is not good enough. What matters is the path to that net zero target. If we are going to emit, continue emitting uh, carbon at the rate at which we are doing now, and then it suddenly in 2050, we'll put in carbon capture and storage and uh, lots of reforestation and get to net zero, that's no good. I think the point that has, needs to be discussed in COP26 is what are we going to do for the 2030 uh, target? The 2030 targets are inadequate. The NDCs which have been promised are inadequate or a path to 1.5 degrees. And the question that I would really pose is that, is it enough to keep to start this pressure on asking countries to talk of net zero without also asking how the available carbon budgets to stay within 1.5 degrees will be shared amongst countries? This is a challenge that if today, the fact is, a lot of the Western countries need to get to net zero well before 2050. If you want a ra rational approach to 1.5 degrees and uh, getting to the, uh, uh, incidentally, the Paris target is a global target. It's not a target meant for individual countries. And uh, if you have to get to the Paris uh, uh, Article 4.1, 4 target of uh, uh, zero emissions in the second half of the century, we have we should be talking about how carbon budgets are to be the available carbon budget is to be allocated between states and our states to then define a time path. Now the problem there is this will count in the American mind as top down. They'll say it's top down. You are negotiating from the top downwards. It should be top bottom up. But I'm happy that there are some announcements by countries like uh, the EU has announced. Uh, a, a substantial escalation in its target for 2030. I believe that uh, Biden may announce uh, something similar for the United States in the course of the meeting this uh, today and tomorrow. I hope that I'm right, uh, that he'll announce a substantial 
enhancement of the old Obama target uh, over these years. But this is what we ought to be talking about. How do I get to net zero? Not when will I reach net zero? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, other, I can, we'll just go around and collect a few questions and, and then come back to you. Any other questions from the audience? Actually, link to what uh, Mr. Desai said, um, you know, one thing about China's announcement, uh, which has uh, has come in the, for discussion a lot, is that while they have said 2060, there is no discussion on what they will do in next 5, 10, 15 years. And um, unless there is some clarity on what China does by 2030 or 40, the target really sounds hollow. So that's one thing which we wanted to understand that is... Uh, is a net zero target alone sufficient or should it be backed up by intermediate milestones of next five, 10 years? Um, thank you, uh, Anshu. And I cannot agree more with uh, what Nitin Desai said and that you said the net zero in as a commitment doesn't mean a lot if we don't have really very serious, very clear, very credible uh, short term. And, and even 2030 is not that short term, it's 10 years, no? So I, I do think that, uh, as, as, as you said, in Glasgow, the, the moment of truth is about the short-term action. Uh, it's, it's good to position the short-term commitment in the perspective of the net zero, because in a way, that make a judgment of how enough or not enough the short-term targets are. And that exactly is a discussion today. No, I understand that Japan is uh, wavering if they announce a minus 46 or, or 50%, that US, et cetera. So um, I totally agree. And this is not e even only on, because we, we hear a lot of businesses that are uh, announcing net zero commitments, uh, investors as well. But you know, if there is no short-term action, that doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm, I'm a very, you know, I'm an obsessed by the long-term pathway, as, as you know. No, I've been willing to put that in the Paris Agreement but this doesn't mean anything if there is no short-term credible, that one, you don't describe the pathway to get there and, and discuss, of course, internationally because we need cooperation. And then, of course, to have the short-term targets uh, well, well placed. So I think that's the challenge for now. Uh, on the sense where I am, do I am pessimistic or optimistic? I don't know, but I, I feel that at least there is now more pressure than everybody revise the plans. Now we have new data on the cost of renewable energy. We know that it can create jobs, but still, of course, the carbon content of the global economic growth is still very high. So we need really to change that. And that's why innovation is so important. I So anyway, on the short term, preparing for these big opportunities of the of the sort of sectors and in the economy seems to me a, a very, very important discussion in each country. I agree with Nitin Desai that the developed countries should reach the net zero uh, much earlier. I totally agree with you as well, Nitin, that we cannot have in 2050 uh, sort of an imagination that with forest and carbon capture will solve the problem. That's not true. So uh, insistence on, on the pathway under 2030 and really putting carbon sequestration and, and maybe necessary, but really a very, very margin. So on China, on you, uh, for the moment, of course, everybody is there. China has really the heart of displaying information in a very slow way. So 2060 was, of course, certainly a, a good first move, if we can remember of the very, very silent policy on climate change uh, from China in the last four years. But of course, if there are, is no movement on the coal pipeline investment, if there is no movement on the capital emissions, uh, uh, again, an, a number of sectors. And when you look at, for example, the numbers that are presented for the 14 five-year plan, this is not consistent with 2060 uh, net zero. So. Of course, I suppose that the China government will come with more details that are more consistent with this target. 
uh, and uh, but for the moment, of course, um, and, and I, I can understand the political complexities. I, I am in a way reassured that they consider that climate change is above the tension, the geopolitical tension. So that's positive. Uh, but if everybody, nobody can do anything on climate if if China doesn't decide to do things. And there is this because there is a problem of the carbon budget left, and it's of course smaller and smaller. So uh, I have anxiety. I hope the signal from China these uh, these two days would be positive. And that would then generate uh, a, a more, more, in a way, more commitment from countries really to look at their economic model. Thank you, Laurence. Uh, Shubhashish has a question. Shubhashish, would you like to uh, please go ahead? Thank you, Angshu. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, centered around the whole uh, discussion of a just transition, one at a national level and the other at an international level. At the national level, countries like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, where uh, uh, almost 70% of the population falls under some or the other kind of vulnerable uh, community, how do we make this transition uh, from uh, being a carbon centric to a low carbon economy model? and then also uh, ensure that developmental in uh, human developmental uh, happens uh, at the rate which is expected. Uh, in a scenario where we are not getting a, a lot of investment coming from the global north. Uh, on a global perspective, how just this transition is uh, when we uh, uh, compare between the countries in global north and south, where everybody is talking about taking this 250, uh, 2050 target that everybody reaches the goal line, uh, goal post at the same, uh, or the finishing line at the same point of time? Um, very, very big question. And uh, of course, we, we should put this element of poverty eradication, social justice as a very center of the, of everything we talk about climate. And maybe, I think uh, India could be particularly well placed to propose a, a way to, to, in a way, go to this decarbonized economy, but in a way that really uh, is a poverty eradication project. Um, and, and looking at the example you are giving on India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, uh, communities that are impacted already. Well, let's think about what happened in, in well, in, in your two regions and Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, and uh, and how much they will be. This community will be more impacted even, and still don't have access to the minimum in in some time access to energy, for example. So you know. Um, is that why I, I think if now the all Indian stakeholders just think about what would be a just transition for these communities, how, what kind of job we have to create for them that are really in this net zero economy, what kind of access to energy. And, and I know you have been working, many of you, on the access to renewable energy in decentralized networks, etc. But uh, again, for agriculture, of course, how we, we, we move in agriculture that's more resilient uh, to climate impacts and, and, and in a way that protect. And I know, of course, the farming question is a very hot issue in India these days. So maybe India could lead the reflection on the consumption model, as, as you have been doing many times. I remember very good discussion with my Indian colleagues on the consumption model. Um, you know, it's not only about changing the economy, but taking leadership in the in the thinking. And uh, so, uh, I think the which is good. I I, tell you, I don't want to be too long, but what is good is that we cannot think now because climate policies are everywhere: uh, finance, technology, uh, mobility, buildings, agriculture. So there is no sector that is not part of the reflection. And so for that reason, I think um, 
even now you you see how in a way trying to emulate in a way the consumption model of India, how the meat consumption in, in Western countries are going down. And uh, so uh, it would be really, really helpful because this is a very big transformation of the economic model, like it is with this overconsumption, with obsolescence of object. There is no solution for everybody that, or you know that India knows that better than anybody, any other country. And uh, I, I think that this transition should be, uh, the just transition should be the overarching objective of the international community. And for the moment, of course, we, everyone is thinking about that in its own space. Uh, I, even looking at the European community, the European Union, every country is thinking about what is a just transition for my country. And I don't believe it can work. Uh, because of course we are in a very integrated economy already, and um, and so again it's a it's a it's a very interesting way of thinking now to think about how collective can be this reflection and this cooperation about transition. We we need to have a bottom up element because of course each country has its own constraint, culture needs, but something like it has to be global as well is necessary because if not, we will have a, a, a over, over consumption type of model for the global economy and that will prevent anybody to, to do the right thing. So anyway, I've been long, but I think it's a fascinating discussion. Manu, you, you have a question? Thanks, Sanshu. Uh, my name is Manu, I work with Shakti Foundation. Uh, I think through your talk today, I think one thing which I'm taking away very strongly is the fact that uh, going forward, climate and country relationships are going to be intertwined in a seamless fashion, so to speak, uh, given the kind of geopolitics which is playing around it. So I think this is definitely one takeaway I'm uh, learning from this. Now, uh, you did mention that uh, in terms of the European uh, Foundation, how do you see us collaborating and sort of trying shaping the narrative going forward? So I, would, I was just wondering, given the quality of participation we have on this very webinar, I think the number of actors who are literally decision makers in uh, every sense, I think this could be a unique opportunity where we could consider uh, joining hands in terms of uh, possibly you know, pushing technology uh, and as well as financing some of the uh, critical, I would say, obstacles going forward. Uh, so any thoughts on that? And maybe some other actors who might be having similar uh, thought processes, maybe as Shakti, then we could sort of uh, master a coalition of change going forward like this. I'm sure I don't know if we broaden the conversation and well, I can respond. I, um, I think it's a very good idea, Manu, and just what what I was reading and hearing from Subashi is uh, a very good area of cooperation and very interesting one. Uh, but I would be happy to, to have other views on how we could build something together that, in a way. Yeah, actually, I, you know, uh, Lawrence, the, uh, Manu's, to add to Manu's point, uh, I think it's a great thought. And uh, uh, we, we also have been discussing internally in Shakti plus with our partner funding uh, philanthropic donors that uh, we are looking at a massive energy transition over the next 20, 30 years and uh, which will require enormous public and private investments. So from a philanthropic perspective, can we look at models which pool where funders collaborate together and develop programs uh, so that philanthropic money is better utilized. Uh, often what we have found is uh, donors tend to work in their own spaces. Uh, and uh, I think there's a case where we jointly develop programs or partnerships. For example, Shakti would be very happy to work with ECF. If we can look at, uh, let's say you mentioned the example of hydro uh, uh, hydrogen-based steel production. Mm. If we were to develop a program of how India could move towards hydrogen-based steel, which explores 
the current landscape uh, of steel manufacturing uh, what could be those technology r and d partnerships which enable this transition uh, what is the finance assessment uh, and uh, ecf and uh, shakti could join hands that will be a fantastic effort just to give one example mm-hmm. like that i'm sure there'll be plenty more examples where we can jointly uh, part- participate with finances plus our expertise as well Thank you, Anshu, uh, and following my new vision, um, I think you will be totally legitimate and that will be helpful for the whole philanthropy community, who, of course, is in a way very active in India, but of course, with the constraint we, we know now. Why don't you start, and, and if we can help, with, with really a big pleasure, and maybe we could start from something where ECF is maybe more, more legitimate, like Uh, what is a strategy, uh, in a way, trying to co-construct the strategy in India of different stakeholders, including the philanthropy, uh, maybe on, on specific topics like you, you mentioned on hydrogen. Um, maybe it could be a gathering forces of the philanthropy around this 2030-2050 pathway vision. Could be on just transition, why not? Um, so... Um, So I, I do think that uh, playing a role of convening just to have a more, you know, a more thoughtful, more organized and not silos type of cooperation uh, will be absolutely uh, essential. So I do think, yeah, imagine you, you create a space, a convening where you invite all the philanthropies um, that are working with you and others and with maybe key stakeholders and you de- design what, what are on climate, what are the key elements that we should explore and, and in a way, where are the gaps? I think that I'm sure that will be very useful for everybody. And you, your, your, your thought leadership could, could help everyone. And maybe connecting the dots, I see in the chat that Rajiv is talking about the Green Finance Center of the Singapore Green Finance Center. Uh, so, you know, um, It's interesting, uh, and, and I agree with him, there is little cooperation of really excellent sector in the region. And you know how, again, in this geopol- complex geopolitics, um, and if we don't want to see everything through the military and uh, you know the very much power relationship, but we think about how we connect people that are thinking in a cooperative way, There is a role for Indian centers and, and your in particular, just connecting with the others uh, working in Asia. And, and I think that's really, uh, that's really important. You, you will be a play, you, India will play anyway a, a very central and complex role. Uh, and, and in a way to, to use that leverage intellectually for, for the, all the global discussion, And I, to be undiplomatic and frank with all of you, I know because uh, domestic issues are so high, so important. You, you are, of course, and it's normal. Absolutely, their priority is to solve and improve the, the, the situation in India for all this region and these groups, etc. But it's maybe the time to have a, a, a renewed vision of uh, India's role in the world in, in terms of the thinking of the future. If you believe, if everybody or most people believe in this, the value of this clean, uh, sustainable economy, uh, bringing India as a, as a place of convening and thinking uh, of where, what it would look like, I do think, I, I think sincerely, that would make a big difference. Nobody will believe that China can lead as a model because of all the features and, and particularity of the Chinese model. Uh, and, and the type of type of soft power that India can have, which is particular to your own culture. So I was just thinking that if you want to convene this, all these nodes of thinking and uh, in a way invite the philanthropies to recognize the value of this convening and to work much less in silo, 
I, I would only support that and, and make the case for it uh, with, with our partners. Thank you, Lawrence. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back uh, with some specific thoughts and we'll uh, on some of these partnerships which we can uh, think of. So we'll revert with some specific ideas. Rajiv, you'd like to, uh, you have a question which you'd like to say? No, I'm, I'm fine, uh, uh, Anshu. Uh, just to leave the thought that, uh, uh, you know, this notion of uh, finding uh, uh, convening platforms that are more neutral, um, I think is a very important point um, in, in, in facilitating global collaboration. And um, so we should talk about that because Singapore finds itself also in that, in that situation. Um, so there is there's something in it that we need to think about and come up with a concrete proposal, I think. I think that would be really excellent. Huh? And, and really, if we can connect and support, uh, we will do it with, with a lot of pleasure. Uh, so, Lawrence, one question I have is uh, on uh, the role of nuclear power. Um, uh, is Does nuclear power figure in this discourse on global decarbonization and net zero discussions? Um, especially because uh, in France, of course, a, a large part of electricity is from nuclear power. Uh, and I'm just curious to see where do, does nuclear power figure in the, this debate or people feel it is too expensive, complicated. What's your take on that? Well, you know, there are diverse views. Uh, well, on the cost, if you feel the, if you look at the cost of the new nuclear after Fukushima, meaning with a more safety regulation that are really necessary, uh, you see that, of course, uh, for the moment at least, uh, and I don't have the totally the numbers at global level. I know the numbers for Europe, but and, and that's very high. Uh, you can't have new nuclear by you know by megawatt. Uh, the the cost of the new nuclear will be much much before one hundred fifty some around something like one hundred fifty dollars by for megawatt. Uh, something like that, where you could have even um, you know, um, wind farms, uh, offshore wind farms that will come at 80 something uh, dollars a kilowatt, a uh, megawatt. So the cost is very, and, and maybe my numbers are not, I haven't just, just transition between euro and dollar. So I may be a little bit wrong. It may be a little lower than the 150 I was mentioning for the cost of the new nuclear, but it's very expensive, that's for sure. Uh, it's very expensive because of the new safety regulation. And uh, I don't know, again, the price for China, because of course that's numbers that are not what well, I don't know. And I don't know for India as well. So anyway, we should have a conversation on the, and I haven't seen the, the, last, fig, the last figures from the International Energy Agency, but still, of course, for the moment, you, when you look at just the numbers, um, in, in ways of cost, the net cost, uh, even if you include intermittence, meaning the, the cost of storage of the intermittent, what the wind or solar energy, uh, I think nuclear steel is more expensive now. And that is, of course, the additional problem, which is a, what, how you do with the waste because of this concentration toxicity and the, and the very, very long in time to, to really dilute that toxicity. So that said, uh, it, it is part of the it is part of the picture, not not a lot. Huh? Even when you look at any projection, which are building a up a, a big pipeline of nuclear plants, uh, you see South Africa, many countries. It seems that it will stay at a, at a relatively low rate in the energy mix, but maybe uh, some innovation in the nuclear system can happen many smaller nuclear would result cheaper by, in a way, by unit cost. Um, the waste problem, there's two problems, of course, that the, the link with the military, which of course is the problem we will face, unfortunately, 
uh, which now it, it seems that countries are now building up again their military facilities in nuclear weapons, which, which is a concern. And that to isolate the civil from the military, as, as we know, it's not, it's not easy. Huh? We, we see that in the case of Iran, for example. So um, this is com that are complex questions. So they are not only technical, they are evidently linked to security in the broader sense. Uh, and, um, and I would say maybe that makes sense when you need a very concentrated production of, uh, of energy, of electricity, uh, but you have then to compare how the governance system is working, uh, you know, how the safety, you look at Japan and you see that there was no solid enough uh, control on the nuclear power plant. And that's why finally the catastrophe has gone wild, no? Uh, but uh, it's, so it's, it's, everything is a matter of, can we be sure, can, can every country build its own system where really uh, the security, the safety issue is really uh, uh, assured the maximum. And, and in a context where climate impacts the extreme weather in particular would be, uh, and I, I've, I don't want to be too long either, but, I felt, I felt that when I was in the government in front, in front now many years ago, uh, we, we had a, a very, very big um, uh, wind, uh, a tempest of wind. And it had stopped a number of, and it, for, it created a lot of problems and uh, flooding in particular uh, as a combination with the rain. And the flooding has stopped the pumps that were cooling one of the, uh, nuclear plants in the south of France. And you know, you, you see that these extreme weather events would be multiplied. So we have to prepare the system if we want to continue on that line, because of course, when you have an accident, it's very big. Uh, and so that, but, but again, that it's mainly a governance issue, if I may say so, unsure. It's not a technical one. Thank you, Laurence. Uh, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, we are just five minutes from. Uh... Uh, this uh, closure time. So let me bring this session to a close. Uh, uh, and I really thank you for sparing the time to talk to us and Shakti colleagues and all our partners uh, uh, and giving us lots of ideas to think about in uh, partnerships which we can explore with ECF and also uh, ideas for us to contribute to India's decarbonization uh, processes. Uh, I believe that uh, you know India is in a very unique position where at the moment our per capita emissions is about just about two tons per capita. Now, even if we were to peak, say in next two decades or three decades, let's say, even then uh, our per capita peak would still be around four or maybe four and a half as many studies have illustrated. So we will be really peaking and decarbonizing, decarbonizing from a peak of around four to zero. And that gives India an enormous opportunity in my view yeah. that a model of growth, which is you know, dissimilar to what other countries followed, including China. China is decarbonizing from a peak of nine or 10 tons per capita. Yeah. Whereas we will be decarbonizing from maybe three or four. And Thus, uh, thus uh, you know, integrating efficiency in RE in all sectors of economy in a very aggressive manner, it's an enormous opportunity we have right now to not lock ourselves into a carbon intensive infrastructure over the next few decades, but start action right away. That's been my view on this subject. And I believe um, uh, uh, there are lots of areas where we can uh, partner and work together. We'll revert back to you with some specific thoughts. And again, thank you so much uh, for sparing time to talk to us. I wish you all the best for your uh, surgery and hope all goes well and you, you're safe. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to have initiated that conversation. And uh, really, I will be very, very happy to continue it. So thank you again for the invitation. And thank have a good evening for all of you. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.